First chrysalis of the year. Oh yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Rich Lund, and it's currently July 12th, and monarch season for me is in full swing. Currently, I've taken in 67 lives total. Whether they be eggs or caterpillars, I'm responsible for 67 right now. And so already, compared to some other seasons I've had, this has turned out pretty good by July 12th, 67. Partially, though, that's because a female did an egg dump on my own milkweed plants and gave me 19 eggs all at once. Didn't see it happen, but they're all right in the same cluster. And then also, my mom came to visit, and she brought me 16 lives, 8 eggs and 8 caterpillars that were on her plants. She was heading out for a vacation, so she put them under my care. Thanks, Mom. Now, last year, I also found plenty to keep me busy in June, and so I made a video on the 2017 population status. I was excited because it was the first day of summer vacation, and I found three caterpillars on that very first day. Well, in making that video, I sort of set a precedent because if there's a population status 2017 video, where's the 2018 video? Well, here it is. And if you're into having a quick status check-in with their population numbers each year, well, let me know that in a comment below if I should keep on making one of these each year. Every year, monarchwatch.org makes a beautiful graphic display of the population size of the monarch population that's east of the Rocky Mountains, the one that migrates down to Mexico. This data is really measuring area, the amount of area that the roosting monarchs that are overwintering just to the west of Mexico City in the forests are taking up, are occupying. It's quite fortunate and convenient that this population that migrates decides to all roost in the same location. Again, it's measured in hectares, and for those curious, one hectare is about 2.47 acres. But really, this is a metric system measurement. One hectare is one one-hundredth of a square kilometer. Or in other words, one square kilometer is a hundred hectares. Well, last year's value was 2.91 hectares. This year, there's been a slight decline, and we're looking at 2.48 hectares. So yes, that's a drop in number, but the good news is it's a very slight decline. But as always, what's important to do here is look at the large overall trend. Here is the overall data from the past 24 years that they've been doing this. Now, I don't know how often you look at data and what your eyes see when you see a graph like this, but I definitely notice a few things. First, you can see the reason for concern and action is the overall trend, which is a decline. Using a best fit line for the data points, we get quite the negative slope. This is why we're planting milkweed and raising monarchs in the first place. But the next thing that I see, and I'm sure you do too, is the rise and fall of the population size, almost like little waves. It's a pattern that exists within the data, and I think we should maybe talk a little bit more about it this time. It kind of helps explain why I'm not really that bummed out that we're at a lower number this year than last year. You see, rises and falls in populations like this that are cyclic, it happens quite often in nature. When a population is growing, eventually it's going to reach a limit. And this is due to just how many resources are available for it. Resources like food, territory, things of that nature. Now once a population reaches the limit that the resources can provide for it, it usually flattens out a little bit. At that point, the resources are supporting that population, but not necessarily comfortably. And so, as the population multiplies, not all of them make it. But however many do make it, usually tends to be about the same number as the previous year. These are some pretty basic and well-known concepts when it comes to ecology. But also, if you were to zoom in on many of those lines, you would see that they're not really just straight plateaus. That there's usually a cyclic nature to many populations out there. And this is due, classically, to predator-prey relationships. A rise and fall can easily happen when there's a predator and a prey that are very much linked. The classic example would be rabbits and foxes. Imagine you have a hypothetical situation where you have a population of rabbits and you have a population of foxes. Let's say it's on an island where the fox is the only rabbit predator and the rabbit is the only thing that the fox is able to eat. Well, as the rabbits start doing better and their population increases, that means there's more food for the foxes. They're going to increase too in their population then. But as the predator's population increases, that means more and more rabbits are going to be preyed upon. And so their population is going to eventually start to decline. The decline in the rabbit population leads to a following decline in the fox population because there's less food. 
But if the fox population declines, well, then the rabbits have a greater chance of surviving, and thus their population starts to increase, and the cycle just repeats. Now, we see a similar up-and-down cycle here with the monarchs, but it's not likely that this is due to a predator. Again, with foxes and rabbits, we're just thinking about a hypothetical situation where the predator and prey are linked directly at the hip. When it comes to monarchs, while yes, there's certainly plenty of predators out there for them, there's a variety of predators. And of those things that prey upon the monarch, the monarch isn't their sole source of food. They have many other options too. And certainly, the monarch isn't the predator in this situation. There's no animal that it's preying upon. But switch from the concept of predator-prey, and let's look instead at host-parasite. Host-parasite cycles exist and very much match up with this idea of predator-prey cycles. In fact, when the parasite can only take advantage of one host, well, then those cycles match even closer to this hypothetical model of predator-prey cycles. After all, in the real world, foxes can eat more than just rabbits. For the monarch butterfly, a parasite that very much matches up with this idea is the OE parasite that we've talked about in other videos. Aphriocystis electrocerha. And yes, I know my Latin's horrible. I have videos in the description below that further flesh out the details of the OE parasite. What it is, how its life cycle works, and some options as to what you can do if you encounter this while raising monarchs. I urge you to check out those videos. Now, the OE parasite parasitizes not just the monarch butterfly, but also the queen butterfly. And the queen butterfly population range and monarch butterfly population ranges do overlap in certain places. So certainly, the OE parasite population is affected by both the monarch and the queen butterfly populations in these areas where they overlap. But for much of the population of monarch butterflies east of the Rockies, very little of that area has any queen butterflies in there. So we can look at just the population of those monarch butterflies and the population of OE parasites in those areas, and we can see and conclude that there should be this same type of rise and decline trend in their cycles. Now, I'm not claiming that the OE parasite explains all of the rise and fall in the cycle of the monarch population, but I would say it has a significant impact. OE requires its host to live and become a successful adult in order to help spread the OE parasite. If the OE does too good of a job, if there's too much OE in a monarch, then that caterpillar won't ever make it to the adult stage. And that then is a failure for the OE. So when OE is successful, that means it has parasitized the monarch butterfly, but not so much that it ends up killing it. Instead, that adult can fly off and spread the OE parasite spores to various places. Now what that means, though, is as the monarch population does better, that's going to cause the OE population to do better. Or in other words, increase in number. But just as with the foxes and rabbits, as the OE parasite does better, is more successful and greater in number, that's going to cause larger doses to the monarch caterpillars that end up eating the spores. And if the OE then is too successful, well, then this is going to cause a decline in the monarch population. As the monarch population declines, well, then so does the OE population for that region. And if the OE population declines and falls low enough, well, then this gives the monarch population a chance to recover from the OE parasite and the population starts to rise again. Very similar to our foxes and rabbits situation. If you want to think of the OE parasite as the predator in this, it's the wrong term, but still you can get the same concept of a predator-prey relationship. So here's what I'm getting at. Though the 2.48 hectare measurement is a decline compared to 2.91 of last year, it's not unexpected. What the patterns in the overall data show is that the monarch population tends to reach a high point and then starts to decline after that and that this decline after it's reached a high point is likely a natural occurrence, something like possibly the OE parasite. Again, how much of it is OE that's causing this is debatable, but it's likely a significant cause, and it may even be the primary cause. But there's other significant factors, too, that affect the overall population of the monarchs, particularly random and extreme weather events. This can cause anomalies in our typical pattern that we'd expect. And usually, they're not good ones. Two years ago, during the migratory return of the populations from Mexico up into the states, there was a winter storm that occurred in March of 2016. It occurred in northern Mexico, right along the migratory path. And this storm is predicted to have taken out about 10 million monarch butterflies. As the population of monarch butterflies at that time was around 160 million, 
that's definitely a significant chunk. And that estimate of 10 million might be a low estimate. Extreme heat and drought can also cause the monarch population some pitfalls, especially when they happen at the same time in the same region. And the monarch butterflies this year are experiencing some of that. When monarchs are migrating, if there's a drought that has occurred, there's going to be fewer nectar producing plants. And so there will be losses along the way. In cases of severe heat during the migratory season, this can also cause some trouble for the monarch butterfly. According to Dr. Chip Taylor of monarchwatch.org, when the temperature is exceeding that of the low 80s, this can actually shut down the monarch's decision to continue migrating. That it just won't keep on going if the temperatures are too hot. Now if you pair extreme heat with also drought in the same region during the migratory spring season, you might have monarchs that are waiting out the heat, waiting for temperatures to lower. When they finally do, if this time period has also been nothing but drought, they might find that along their migratory path that there's less and less food. So they've been delayed, not eating, and then as they go to migrate, there's even less food there for them. All of these factors affect the monarch population. So, back to the data. When I look at a graph like this, what I tend to focus on are the highs and the lows. When we're looking at the high points, the swells, that's going to be what indicates to us whether or not the population is recovering. What we really want to see is one of these swells be higher than the previous swell. And we almost had it. Looking at the two population highs from 2010 and 11, compared with that of 2015 and 16, they are so close. In fact, they're so close, you might as well call them the same number. But what I'd really want to see is multiple cycles where the high population number is actually higher than the previous time we had a population swell. And then, let's look at the lows. These are the numbers that really we want to keep our eye on. And they're going to be the numbers that let us know how dire the situation is. You might notice from the data that the low point tends to happen about three or four years after the high point happens. And so the current pattern suggests that next year or the year after is going to be our next low point. Also, we won't know next year if the low point happened or not, because what if the next year is even lower? I would predict, though, based upon the data, next year is going to be even less than 2.48. I hope I'm wrong. But when the low point does happen, whenever that is, what will be very encouraging is if that low point is higher than the previous low point, 0.67 hectares. That's the lowest point it's ever been ever since they started making these measurements. And that's also the same year that I started the Raising Monarchs video series. So there you have it, population status 2018. We're in between high and low points, and I hope to see some encouraging data in the future. I want to thank you very much for showing interest in this video. Thank you very much for those out there who are planting milkweed. That's the number one way to help out the monarch population, restoring its habitat. And if you've gone so far as to raise the monarchs with us, again, I thank you so much. Definitely, they appreciate it. Let us know how your season's going in the comments below, and I'll catch you next time.